Good afternoon, good evening America, good morning Australia, good morning to the rest of the world or whatever your time zone. You are tuned in to the People Who Speak radio show with Steve Johnson. The People Who Speak show normally airs every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. Pacific and 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern on the BBS radio network. Anyone can participate during the show with call-in questions for our guests toll-free in the United States and Canada on 1-888-429-5471. That's right, Corpy, 1-888-429-5471. We have a truly wonderful woman and a gifted author on the show today. I'm more excited than John Howard at a midget convention covered by an Ewok uh, convention. (laughs) She's a brave and courageous woman who has lived through some unspeakable hardships, suffered through the most awful state and church-sanctioned evil of the 1960s and 70s. She is one tough-as-nail Sheila. We are absolutely blessed to have an Australian icon here at the People Speak show. Welcome to the show, Kate Howarth, ma'am. Thank you, Steve. I don't know about icon, but thank you very much. I'll try to live up to that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to to your listeners. Nice to be here. Well, I I see you as a penultimate Australian, somebody who speaks her mind and is not shy to do so. That, that to me, uh, sums up the Australian spirit. Would you not agree? Uh, I think that's pretty right, yeah. Mm. We will be taking. We'll be talking about your second book today, the sequel, award-winning book to Hail Marys, Ten Hail Marys. We'll be taking audience questions after the first half hour. But my first question to you, Ani Kate, is: How did you get started on the book? What prompted you to begin compiling all the memories and and all your experiences into the most compelling, powerful book that it is today? Well, I think I had one of the greatest motivators anyone can have for doing anything, and that's rage, white hot rage. When I realised in my 40s uh, the injustice that had been suffered by young women who had their children taken uh, at birth uh, during the period that is now known as forced adoption practices, you know, I had literally had smoke coming out my ears, and I realised. Uh, That was the first time in my life I realised how important my story was to tell because although I was an unwed mother through the 60s, I did fight uh, the church, my family, society, and I actually kept the baby, which was very unusual. And when the parliamentary inquiry, the first one into adoption practices was held, which was more than just a whitewash in 1998, um, after I read that report, they said they were not able to take evidence from anyone who actually kept the baby of 150,000 girls that went through those homes in New South Wales because that was initially just a New South Wales inquiry. And then I realised as I went read further on into the report and I realised that financial support for us girls was always available but kept hidden. And that was the biggest weapon that they had to use against us. Of course, we were unmarried, we were abandoned by our families, most of us were broke and we were d- desperate. And, of course, they said, well, how are you going to keep this child? You've got no means of support. So it was very, very easy to coerce young women to sign those consent for adoption uh, when they felt that they would be going out into an unknown with no money, no support. And uh, when I realised that that support was available all the time, well, I knew I had to write the story. And I wanted it to hit the ground running. I want, it took me five years to write because I had to, first of all, teach myself to write. And uh, and I wanted it to be written by me, not a ghostwriter. So I had a thousand and more rewrites. Writing, they say, is about rewriting, and that's for sure. And I, I wanted it to be a book that would not just sit on the shelf or wouldn't wouldn't get any, um, any hearing. I wanted it to really make a splash because I, I really wanted it to put this topic on the front burner and get politicians interested, get people interested who could actually do something about it. And uh, because all of the young women who lost their children, of course, they were traumatised into silence. They'd been labelled heartless sluts who didn't want their kids and just had to go off and get on with their lives, most of them not even knowing what the sex of the child was and uh, never seeing or having held the child. It was a shocking, shocking time, Steve. So, you know, I had rage is the simple answer. (laughs) That's the long answer. Short answer Mm. is rage. Rage motivated me. Mm. And it wasn't just a bit of pressure on you to give up your child. They they resorted to all kind of tactics. After reading the book, I was kind of shocked. Uh, they, They tried blackmailing you, bribing you. They tried absolutely threatening you. What were some of the worst things that you faced uh, to try and force you to give up your child? 
Well, if you understand, we were in these homes and although we weren't locked in, we were pregnant and, you, you know, society uh, didn't allow, you know, didn't really assist pregnant girls. There were no support networks there and we were shamed into keeping ourselves hidden. So you were virtually trapped in these places. You were working, you know, slave labour. You were working, you know, eight hours a day, six and a half days a week. And, uh, you know, that their, the capacity for them to apply intimidation tactics was pretty high. Um, you'd have to say that the tactics they used were tantamount to torture. Uh, there were a couple of days, you know, that, that re really reached a peak. Um, one of them was on Boxing Day, 1965, and bearing in mind I'm still only 15 at that stage. I'm two, two weeks from my 16th birthday. I'm eight months pregnant. I've been accused of being <laughs> being seen across the road at a pub which was a slop shop i mean this this uh, hospital was in the red light district of uh, sydney i had no idea where darlinghurst was in those days but that's where it, that's where it was and because i still hadn't signed the consent for adoption by christmas uh the hospital administrator cranked up the heat and she was threatening to throw me out of the hospital if i didn't sign the consent and i had a big showdown with her and my uncle stan and my aunt were present they were the only members of my family who came to see me and uh, Uncle Stan, of course, was a very devout Catholic, and I'm standing there virtually calling this nun a liar in, in so many words, and he was shocked and horrified. Uh, anyway, she didn't buckle. I didn't sign the consent, and she was telling me, go pack your bags, you're leaving. And so I did, and, and I had no idea. I went, went and got my things out of the room and walked to the uh, front of the hospital. I had no clue where I was. I had $20 in my pocket. And um, I'm looking left, looking right, thinking, which way do I go? Where do I go? And uh, so that was pretty hard. Uh, then, of course, they really cranked up the heat after after my son was born and I still hadn't signed the consent. Well, things just got harder and harder. And I, I'll leave the readers to read that. I mean, I, I don't I think back now, I think, God, how did I ever survive that? How did I not go completely off my head? I'm not sure I didn't, to be honest, but um it was a terrible amount of pressure to put a kid under, particularly a, a young mother. Now, the feelings that I get when I read the first book, Ten Hail Marys, is that uh, life in the early 60s and 70s in Australia, it was a system of rules and policies that really didn't care what effect those policies had on the individual. Do you see that still very much the same today in Australian government and politics? It was more so then, I think, um, you know, bearing in mind back then, Steve, we still had the uh, White Australia policy. We still had the Removal Act for Aboriginal children. Uh, contraception and uh, wasn't available to women. Uh, abortions were illegal. And uh, if you did what I did, uh, went through and, and kept the child, you were labelled a, a heartless bitch who, uh, you know, uh, thought more of herself than, than the child for not giving it up for adoption. So, thing, you know, particularly for women and children, I mean, children didn't have a voice at all. You know, I, I, I back-chatted my grandmother one day and she just sent me to a home. She just got wow. the child welfare to take me away. Well, you read that. I spent a year in a home just for back-chatting my grandmother. Um, they could do that. You see, I was a ward of the state and she could do that. She said, you know, you'll behave yourself or I'll send you away, and she did. Uh, <laughs> so so that, was how, that was how powerless we were as kids. Um, for women, it was... You know, pretty. We were chattels. You know, you you've read the second book, and you know that by 17, 1977, I was twenty seven years old, and I had to go and get consent from a from a my husband, my first husband, whom I hadn't seen for nine years. I had to go and get his consent to get a passport. So things were pretty heavily weighted against women back then and children. Yeah, it was a man's now, world. Personally, why do you think it is so many people back then? were deluded into thinking they were doing the right thing when, by today's standards, such attitudes are horrific. Why do you think it is that uh, it was the done thing back then? Do you think people just didn't know any better? I don't think they deluded them. I think that their ego was such. Families didn't want the shame of a... Uh, bearing in mind, we were largely a white Christian community back then. That, that was predominantly the, the you know, the uh, demographic. And uh, to have a child out of wedlock, to have sex out of marriage, of course, was scorn, but of course everybody did that anyway. Uh, but to have a child out of wedlock and have what was called an illegitimate child, I mean, they were actually had no legal rights, these children. They were bastards. So there was a very definite stigma on the family who had a bastard child in the family. 
not so much in my Aboriginal family because we all we all were <laughs> little black bastards were running around everywhere. But um, in the white Christian community, uh, which is where I was sent to this home, you know, it was scorned. And look, I was fifteen, Steve, and I knew that what they were doing was wrong because I was yes, coming yes. from the place of a child. And from the place of a child who was raised on a, I spent a lot of time on a farm. Uh, I saw how, and and my, one of my uncles, he he bred dogs, and he had the concern that he put into that mother not to take, not to whelp those pups too soon, don't go near her while she's feeding, all that sort of thing, an absolute profound respect for the mother, and not to take the pups away too soon because it will destroy the mother who's thrown the pups. So I understood this, and I thought if that applies to a dog. Why doesn't it apply to humans? Yeah, so I was a bit like the emperors. I was a kid, you see. I wasn't an adult. I was only a young girl, 15. And I'm thinking, no, this is wrong. You're telling me it's not wrong. I know it's wrong. Now, we live in 2015, and today, despite years and years of commissions and hearings and, and, and policy changes into uh, forced adoption, do you think today, in 2015, that child protection policy often still gets so very wrong in many cases? Well, I think the evidence says it does, to be honest. You know, look at the children today uh, in this country, Steve, who have been killed uh, in violence, in families. Uh, it's it's epidemic. And uh, But you know what? It always has been. It's just that the internet now and the way news gets out on, on, our, on our internet, we see it's more prevalent, it's more in our face. But uh, it's always been a problem. And, yes, uh, the, the services do get it wrong, I'd have to say, most of the time. Wow. Now, now, being an Indigenous woman and a proud Indigenous woman, uh, which is fantastic, I, I'm, I guess this question is aligned to you. How closely uh, similar are the forced adoption policies of the 60s and 70s? How closely similar are they to the stolen generation policies of the years before? They're worlds apart. Um, the stolen generation, that was legal. Uh, that was the government who passed an act. Uh, with the with the absolute express purpose of breeding out the black fella, that's in the law. Um, that was legal to to remove um, light skinned Aboriginal kids or half castes, wow. quarter castes or quadroons and all the names they had for us. But they could literally just come into a family that they saw a light coloured uh, Aboriginal kid and just remove them, just take them, and, and take them right away from their family, right away from their community. And, of course, the younger they took the child, <clears throat> the least, and, and they would look for very young children. I can remember as young as three years of age having to run and hide under the house or my granny, she had a big kitchen table and she put a tablecloth, she made it go right to the floor and if a car pulled up at the front, she'd say, quick, Katie, get under there. And I'd have to sit there as quiet as a bloody mouse trying not to breathe while these people mm. came in and uh, inspected our house because they could. The Aboriginal Protection Board could just come in. But they were actually looking for kids, light-skinned kids, and they'd take us away. Now, that's when we get to the forced adoption practices, they broke the laws. There was a Child Adoption Act uh, of 1939 which clearly stated that you couldn't take consent before the child was born. Uh, you had to let the mother know of all of the options that were available, including the financial support that was available, and there was a 30-day revocation period when she could change her mind and the, and the adoption would not go through. None of those points were told to any of the young mothers who went through those homes. And we're talking 350,000 young Australian girls when our population was only about 4 million, so it's a lot of girls and a lot of babies and a lot of families that were affected. And uh, by, by not telling the young mothers of that help that was available, of course, they were able to procure these these babies for what became a very rapacious adoption industry. And they, so were, they actually made a huge business out of that, selling babies. Is that not true? Well, absolutely. It was a profit-driven a profit driven business, no doubt about that. Hmm. Damn, they, didn't just give, they didn't just give healthy newborns away. Now, the biggest question in my mind after reading Ten Hail Marys, the best-selling book, a winner of the Nonfiction uh, Age Award, Book of the Year 2010, is how on earth did you keep your sanity through some of these stories that I, I read in this book? It, it seems like anybody, a lesser human being, would not have been able to take that. There were some dark passages in your life before you had your son Adam, and even darker times during your pregnancy. What kept you sane through it all? Was it your personal toughness? 
No, I don't think it was my personal toughness. I think it was just an, an innate understanding that you have to try and keep yourself above it. You know, you have to try and keep your head above the water. And I guess that comes from, you know, when I learned to swim, I was literally thrown in the deep end by my biggest, by my, by my eldest brother. And I remember going under and having to paddle all the way to the top. And if I could just keep my head above the water, I could get over to the edge of the pool. And so that was the analogy for me, just to keep my head above water and, and look for the look for something to to hang on to. And for me, always from as young as I could put a pen to page, writing uh, was one of my sources. And I used to you know write endless diaries. I'd write things down as they were happening, and then I'd go back over them and I'd look at them. And they just that just kept me grounded. And also music, uh, music. Although I didn't have an instrument as a child. I loved to sing, so I would sing in the dark if I felt frightened. I, I would, I would um, find some way to, you know, just to find some happiness for myself, and that kept me going. One amazing statement that you made in the book that really hit me and sums up uh, your determination is a passage that you wrote saying, and I quote: "They can lock up my body, but my dreams belong to me." Do, do you think That's that right. sums up your determination and how you managed to live through all that? Oh, most definitely. And when you realise that, if you are incarcerated, and we've seen that happen, you know, Papillon, those great movies you see where people, and, you you know, you read about Nelson Mandela and people who've been incarcerated for many, many years under gruelling, brutal conditions, uh, you know, they, they keep themselves together with their imagination. They keep themselves together with their mind. You know, the mind is becomes the most powerful, beneficial, you know, you've got to try and hang on to that and uh, hang yeah. on to your yeah. the best way you can. Now, in the sequel called Settling Day, um, I noticed that uh, one thing that, that um, uh, distinguished this book from the first one is in the first book is all about growing up. In the second book, it seemed to me that you were finding the family life that you didn't have when you were growing up. Is that kind of true, that you were looking for that family life, the, the, the husband and the kids and, and everything that you wanted to live for? Well, the second book is also about growing up, really, because I didn't get to grow up when I was a kid. You know, I missed my childhood, I missed my teens, and I go into adulthood without any of those formative years giving me the solid grounding that one usually gets if you if you come from a, a family where you've got good role models and you're you're guided through and you finish your schooling. Or, I mean, all of those things were denied to me. Uh, so my my uh, journey was to. You know, I was I was constantly learning and constantly growing and having to nurture and and mother myself. So, you know, the book isn't about you know it, it, the growing up doesn't stop at ten Hail Marys. It continues. You know, right. my, my growth to finding myself, the growth to maturity. No, my drive wasn't so much uh, as you know. At the end of ten Hail Marys, I'm seventeen. I'm homeless, penniless. I've lost the, the child. I've kept fought so hard to keep, and I've got to go forward. You know, without a thing, without anything, with just a suitcase, a sewing machine, and a few bucks in my pocket. And uh, that that was the starting point at seventeen. And but the drive there was to get my get my son back. And I knew to do that, I had to improve my position. I had to get an education. I had to get into a good job. I had to work my way to a position where, if necessary, I was in a strong position to go and kick those doors down, if necessary, to get my son back. So I wasn't driven mm -hmm. to, to marry and to have more children. In fact, I was not going to have more children. I would probably never have had another child if I hadn't had my son, uh, if I hadn't brought my son back into my life. So... I was driven for 14 years to do that, and two years after my son and I were reunited, I fell pregnant and had another child. Mm. At one stage in Settling Day, in one section in the book, you visit a, a psychic and a handwriting analyst called Mr. Haig. How much did that visit and, and that influence from him, how much did that change your life? Well, let me just tell you, Haig was not a psychic. In fact, he scoffed anything to do with psychic phenomenon. Uh, oh. He was a professional. No, he wasn't a psychic. He was a psychiatrist and a psychologist and a medical practitioner, but he certainly was a man of science. He wasn't a, he wasn't a psychic. And when I, when he was uh, reading, analysing my handwriting, because he, he told me some extraordinary things and I'd not met the man and he did it all from samples of my handwriting when it was sent to him for you know, an assessment by a firm I was working with and they wanted to promote me to a very senior position and they used to use Haig Masters and his wife, Josephine, 
as industrial psychologists and consultants to, to determine, you know, the suitability of people to take on these more senior roles. And particularly as I was a woman, and they've never had a woman in this in this particular job before, uh, I had to agree to subject myself to this uh, test. And when I finally got to meet Haig at his property out at um, Oakdale, which you, you read about, was most unusual sort of practice that he ran. He didn't have an office and you walked around the bush, you sat on, on bush rocks and, and uh, you met, this man was the most extraordinary human being I think I've ever met or likely to meet. And he started talking and, and I, I said to him, you know, Haig, I, I can kind of read handwriting. You know, I get, I get images when I see handwriting and I look at it. Um, is that psychic? Well, he nearly slapped me. He said, no, there's no such thing. He scoffed it completely. And he said, no, it's, it's a science. He said, but what you're seeing, Kate, because you've had to learn to read people from a very early age, you have developed a very high, um, you have a highly developed intuitive skill. So that's what comes into play. When you're in the company of someone, you know, you're not actually reading their body language like a body language expert, but you just absorb a lot a lot to do with that person. And he said you're particularly attuned to someone's voice. You you will very you will never forget a voice once you hear it. And I tell you that's true, Steve. After years I can hear a voice from my past and I know exactly who it is. And he said that's because you had to listen to your grandmother so intently because she was so volatile, she was so unpredictable. You had to pick her mood from her voice. And so you developed and honed that skill very young. Anyway, Haig went on. I did study handwriting analysis with Haig and, and went on to introduce that or include that in my professional life um, some years later. And I do believe that there was one guy that you did a handwriting analysis on. He turned out to be an absolute killer. Is, is that not true? Well, there, are, there, there were many examples I could have, could have put in there, but I put in one that I knew if anybody wanted to check it through the news or through sources. You know, when you make a claim like that and you write it in a book, it's best to, to, to put something that you know can be checked. And so Angelo Angelides was the man's name and I was given his application on the fly really and, and because he was being considered as the personal driver for the senior partner of one of the world's uh, most you know, prestigious accounting firms. So it was a pretty important job. And I, I got this, you give, yeah, have a look at this, and I looked at it and I said, oh, the man's an assassin. And I handed it back to the, I said, no, he's no good for the job, he's an assassin. And, of course, he stopped him in his tracks. He said, God, you can see that? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, uh, well, he, he was in the secret police in Cyprus. I said, well, point, you know, I'll rest my case. Anyway, um, I said, oh, another thing about this fellow, I said, if he does ever, if he ever killed anyone and he was caught, uh, he'd, he'd, he'd kill himself before he was brought to justice. Now, that was... You know, a few years later, I'm on a ferry uh, with the same man. I ended up, this man ended up being my husband eventually. And he handed me a newspaper. He said, have a look at that. And he was a story in the paper about Angelo Angelides who killed his wife and then hung himself in his cell before he was sentenced. So that's why that was put in there. But I could give you many, many funny examples. I mean, I could write a whole book on the stuff that came out of a handwriting analysis, I could tell you. Goodness me. And the company that you worked with, they weren't just an Australian company. They were, in fact, an international global business that you became a, a co-partner with. Is that not true? Well, I didn't work with them. I became a director very quickly after joining the company, and the company was privately owned, uh, and I became a co-owner and director uh, within a year of joining the company. It was a franchise of the American group Manpower, and... Um, it was in its, you know, it was really not much of a company here at the time. They were doing mostly industrial work, and I and I was brought in to uh, to open up um, an office division for the company. And yes, it went on to become a leader in its field in Australia. Mm. So, how much of that has actually uh, influenced your life since joining that company and realizing that you can reach your goals, no, no matter how much you uh, are told you can? Did did that actually give you some kind of uh, inspiration to keep going and going bigger? No, I'd, I'd reached many goals, many milestones before I reached before I got to manpower. You know, I, as I said, I'd started off at seventeen, with virtually no education beyond you know <laughs> high school, or even didn't finish high school. So I had to didactically teach myself all of the things that that equipped me to do that. Um, one of them, of course, was accounting. I discovered things that that I could do that took me into a male domain. Um, I could learn through the library, and and which I did. And I would apply for jobs in the accounting field and then I worked my way up and I became a national sales manager. 
And then I, I worked for an employment company before I joined uh, Manpower in Sydney. But I'd already climbed up the ladder by the time I got to, uh, you know, got to, you know, own and operate Manpower. So, and then it was just growing that business then. And, and of course, it was a very exciting time because it was on, the, it was the birth of office automation in the world and certainly in Australia. And as you know, Steve, because of our isolation down here, we, we just really, Grabbed off, you know, office automation, and we became, you know, forerunners, and you know, we had we couldn't get enough of it because we weren't so close. You know, Europe, we didn't have Europe on our doorstep. We had to fly, you know, seventeen hours or so to get to the United States, and so we um, we really embraced it. And, and when I went to the uh, the states in the ni- late nineteen seventies, and I saw these amazing things that they were calling IDDUs, inter- interactive digital display units, which of course we now call PCs. I could see a huge future for it and I thought, gee, we've really got to gear up to this. If we gear up to this, we will be a leader in the field within five years and, of course, we did. And and so that plan was uh, put in place and uh, by 1985 uh, we had the first word processing training centre ever to be introduced into Australia and, you know, we had more than 3,500 temps out in the field in any one day. It, was, it became huge. Wow. wow. And I believe you, you instituted personally... The, the idea of having somebody temporarily and then possibly hiring them for permanent if they were they were in there. What, what was that called? There was a special name for that. Well, that was something, that was an innovation of mine called Job Prove because we didn't do permanent placements and, and I really didn't want to get into permanent placements because that was a commission-driven uh, industry. It didn't require a lot of it. In these days, it requires more, you know, very often university degrees before you'll go into a human resources uh, management company these days, but back then it was a it was a pretty tawdry sort of industry, and I really didn't have I had only had disdain for it. Um, but we had many you know situations where uh, the customer would uh, say, say I'll just name City Corp for one. We would have I don't know fifty temps out in the field with City Corp on any day, and most of those jobs were they were filling those jobs while we that we were, some other company was waiting to uh, to employ someone full time. And then, of course, they'd find someone full-time and realise that the full-time person wasn't as good as the temp. So I thought, hang on a minute, we can solve this. <laughs> we can put people in as a temp, let them work there for eight weeks. If they're happy, off you go. No no fee. We get eight weeks temporary work out of it. The, the person gets the, the applicant gets a job and the customer gets, the, you know, someone who's been on the job and proven the job out. So it was called Job Prove and it was hugely successful. Now, apart from the awards, how much of your books influenced Australian life? How much have they influenced the policies of Australian politics today? Oh, gosh, I don't know. All I do know is that I don't know that they've influenced politics, but they, it was certainly instrumental in getting a Senate inquiry uh, into adoption practices going. But I didn't do that single-handedly. There were other people involved as well, an organisation right. called Origin, whom I give full credit to. You know, they've been working very hard on this and getting nowhere, uh, for a long time, they needed a, another boost, and my my book gave it that boost. But you know, it wasn't solely down to me, Steve. There were women who'd been fight in this fight for ten years before I even had my book launched. My book was just an, an aid, if you like, to what they were already doing. And uh, so, yes, it did change policies, and it did affect. You know, certainly there were apologies given, but it also changed policies. It changed the adoption practices, and and you know, the laws were reviewed and and uh, instruments were put in place so this could never happen again. Now, I feel that um, your, your book did influence politics. I think that it put a very, very human face on the problem of the 1970s that we had with the forced adoption practices. Do, do you think now, looking back, that, um, that these things were just completely inhumane? They were inhumane. There's no other way to view it. Um, you know, what they did was just appalling really if you think about it you don't even need to think about it do you young girls get pregnant they get banished from their families they get put into institutions they work you know in dreadful hours you know the girls who had actually signed the consent for adoption have got got a better better run at the run at it than I did of course because I was being punished and they were trying to break my will so I was given grueling work longer hours you know I was really they were trying to beat me into the ground um you know, if you if you given consent for adoption, you could sit in the first in the um, um, private hospital polishing silver all day, <laughs> while I worked in the laundries and the kitchens. 
Now, the conditions that you had in these uh, particular uh, homes in the in the, uh, the the Saint Margaret's, I believe it was, there was almost like gulag conditions. When I read it, that some of the fighting for scraps of bread and fighting for food and and seeing moldy meat on the on the tables, that that's really really horrible compared to uh, what what we should expect from a place like that. Is that not true? I don't think even Dickens could have written it. You know, it's worse than any Dickensian story you'd ever want to read. Um, it was an, it was yeah, nightmarish. Yeah. Absolutely, it was it was anarchy. There were no, there was nobody overseeing us. It was dog eat dog. The, the the accommodation was was absolutely a hovel. It was the old nuns' quarters, and I remember having to scrub the cell. And it only was a cell that I that I was allocated. I had to get down on my hands and knees and scrub that room for about two hours before I felt like I could unpack my suitcase. And wow. um, the food, again, we were 15-year-old kids. Most of the girls had never boiled an egg. They had no idea how to cook for themselves. And, and the food, the staple food was, was bread, eggs and cornflakes, which is highly unsuitable for young pregnant girls. And of course, the eggs would constipate and the milk was, you know, I guess the milk was good, but um, you know, cornflakes and, and eggs and, and white bread. Occasionally, meat would be brought over and left on the bench in the summertime once. A big leg of lovely, big leg of lamb. It smelled great until you realised it was crawling with maggots. Um, so that was uh, that was the way it was. And nobody came wow. to check on us. So, you know, you, you couldn't your clothing. You couldn't hang your, your your clothing out on the line, or people would steal your underwear. And it it just really was the most dreadful conditions that we were reduced to living under. Hmm. And this was under the auspices of the Catholic Church, right? Well, you know, it wasn't I just can't blame just the Catholic Church here. You know, everyone was out to lunch. The child welfare should have been looking in on us. Um, the Department of Labor and Industry should have been taking a note that all and hundreds of girls were working in these hospitals, not just St Margaret's, without pay, um, in, in appalling conditions, unsafe conditions in the kitchens and laundries. Everyone was out to lunch. Unfortunately, because the, the churches, the institutions, and I, and I stress it wasn't just the Catholics, uh, but the, the church-run institutions, uh, nobody thought that uh, to even inspect them. So they got away with whatever they wanted. And some were worse than others. St Margaret's was the, you know, probably at the, the worst end of the scale. But I've since met unmarried girls who were, who were at other church institutions uh, who weren't treated anywhere near as appallingly as we were at St. Margaret's. So it did vary from place to place. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, this is a People Speak radio show. I'm your host, Steve Johnson, talking with special guest author Kate Howarth from Australia, live on radio. And we'll be right back with our guest and audience questions after this short message break. If you care about humanity, if you care about stability for the human race, then you would care enough to stop funding Israel. Subscribe now. You're listening to the People Speak Radio Show on the BBS Radio Network, coming to you live across America and across the world. I'm your host, Steve Johnson, and we're back tonight with our very special guest, Auntie Kate Howarth. Welcome back there, ma'am. Thank you, Steve. Well, indeed, we do have a caller in. This is the People Who Speak radio show, and we get calls from all over the world. We have a guy who goes by the name of Corp Fascist coming to us live and direct from Ohio. Are you there, Corp? I'm here. Go ahead, sir, with your question to Auntie Kate Howard. Hi, Kate. It's always great to hear from you. I, I want to ask you this simple question. What is it that you want me to learn from what you've experienced in your life? I don't think you can learn anything from my experience at all, Corp. I think all of your lessons have to come from your experience. All you could probably do if you read my books is uh, perhaps be entertained, I would hope. Uh, if there is some connection in there uh, in your life, that would be great. Uh, but at least I could guarantee you a rollicking good read. Some laughs, uh, bearing in mind it's R-rated, It's uh, there's adult themes, sex scenes, violence, coarse language. It's all there, but I don't know that it'll teach you anything. Well, thank you very much for your question there, Corp. Fantastic answer there, Auntie. You know, I think I did personally. I took something away from this, and that is no matter how much the, the struggle is, no matter how overwhelming the odds are against you, if, if you want to make it through and you believe in yourself, you will always do that. Do you think that's a good uh, analogy? Well, I, I think it's a good and I think it's a good thing to have, but I don't think it does actually apply in real life to, to many people. Some people can have all the will, but the ads are so hopelessly stacked against them. You know, I have to say that 
I was very lucky on a number of occasions to meet people who put, put, put out their hand and I was able to grab it. I didn't do everything absolutely on my own, Steve. You know, there were people and you read about them in the book and I give them full credit for being there for me. And I think that that's important, you know, to be not, not to isolate yourself so much, not to think that you have to do it all yourself. Be prepared to take that hand up uh, if you get it. You know, someone puts out their hand and help, uh, says, look, I, you know, please take my hand. Um, I've never rejected that. And I've met some wonderful people who have, from a very young age, saw uh, the potential in me. Uh, Haig Masters, of course, was one of them. He was pivotal to my going forward and doing what I did with my life. And, and other people like Alwyn White that I mentioned, Peggy Levy, yeah, there are a number of them that, um, you know, and my uncle Stan, that there were a lot of people that, um, you know, I, I have to say deserve recognition for for my survival uh, in some instances and and also for having gone forward and enjoyed the life that I've, I've been able to enjoy. Mm. Mm. Now, now, interestingly, in, uh, in the first book, Ten Hail Marys, there is a section there where you actually uh, talk about experience a ghost of your pop. Is that true? Did you actually feel that there was a spirit of your deceased uh, Pop that was in the house? Well, that's what I was told it was. Um, Pop had died. I was there when Pop died, and it was the first person that actually died in front of me. Uh, I nearly set him on fire, incidentally, if <laughs> you remember. I was packing his pipe, and he had a hairy chest pop, and it was a very hot day. And I packed his pipe, and he started to cough, and I didn't realise it was the death rattles. And, and I dropped the pipe and, and spilled it all over him and his, his chest went up in flames and so I nearly set him afire before he passed away. But sometime after he passed away, um, I'd lay in bed and he had a very distinct sound when he knocked a pipe out, he had a glass ashtray and he'd, he'd give it three knocks, bang, bang, bang. And then because he was a, an old man and he, his bedroom was just across the hall from the bathroom and it was like linoleum floors and he had leather soles, slippers, so you hear this <laughs> as he shuffled to the bathroom. And a few weeks, I don't know in terms of time, I can't remember now, but I remember lying in bed. I used to share a bed with my grandmother and I heard the tap, tap, tap and I listened and I heard the <laughs> and I said, no, oh, Mama, can you hear that? Can you hear that? And she just said very blase, oh, yes, love. She said, that's just Pop. Don't worry. He won't hurt you. <laughs> so that's the way it went. So you have a strong belief in the afterlife, that there are spirits around us that guide us? Um, I've had some experiences, Steve, which I can't deny. I, I can't explain them um, in, in scientific terms. But I, I, I have been left with a... With a um, an appreciation, if you like, that, that there is something more, that we do live beyond this earthly existence. And when I was putting those parts in the book, uh, friends of mine, atheist friends of mine particularly, you can't put that in the book. People think you're stark raving mad. And I said, well, look, it happened. And and, and I've witnesses to it happening. So I, I'm not going to put it, not put it in the book because you think I'm a nutcase because you don't believe in these things. So, yeah, they're in there and they happened and they were very, they were, some of them were a catalyst, as you know, particularly Auntie Daphne. I, I couldn't possibly leave that out of the book because that was pivotal to finally being reunited with my son. So, yeah, those things actually happen. Now, your book, Ten Hail Marys and Settling Day, are both available on Amazon for around 30 odd dollars, and they are definitely worth a read. Now, not just for the personal story, but for the, uh, the things you experienced, the things you went through, and, and how you transformed yourself into a powerhouse of a woman. Now, is there one thing that uh, stuck in your mind while you were writing the books about what you wanted to express to people, or, or you just wanted to tell your story? Well, as I said, the first book was beyond just telling my story. I was very reluctant memoirist. In fact, when I first saw the the fernal, the first muck up of the mock up of the of the cover, they had memoir on the front, and I flipped. I said, "It's not a memoir, please don't. Th this is not about me. I didn't want the story to be about me, because the message that I was wanting to convey was the you know the forced adoption practices, and it only became about me because I had to go back and explain." how a young girl of 15 got the strength to stand up to church and family and, and, and all of the conditions of the day that, that dictated, really, that I surrender my child for adoption. 
And so that's how that part of the book came came to be. And um, and then, the, as you know, the book ends very abruptly and very sadly. There's no happy ending to Ten Hail Marys. It's bang, because that's how it was. And mm. at the end of it, um, I did do an epilogue because I was completely drained when I wrote that book. It took everything out of me because I really wanted it to be what it turned out to be, an award winner, a bestseller, you know. It opened up an inquiry. It achieved everything and more. But the greatest thing that it achieved for me as a writer were people coming back to me and saying they really enjoyed it. They couldn't put it down. That's where I get my. That's where I get my joy. My personal joy comes from knowing that the effort that I put into writing that book gave someone pleasure to read it. For sure, yeah, and, and touch their hearts, no doubt. Now, now I see in both books that you've written there is a focus on injustice towards women. Uh, it followed on in Settling Day. It just continued on. Do you believe that things have changed in this respect through the years since you uh, since you experienced those things? There have been some significant changes, obviously. Uh, women today in, in 2015 enjoy uh, many more liberties generally than women of my era in the 1960s and earlier. Um, not the 1970s was a massive um, shift for women with the feminist movements and so on, and of course the unions who helped the feminist movements uh, in the workplace and better conditions and equal pay and all of those sorts of things. Um, there are still some things that are really way out of whack, and that is, you know, the, the violence against women is still in, you know, in this country, Steve, it's still epidemic. Um, I don't know why men feel so dispossessed in this country that they feel they need to knock the crap out of their wives, but they still do. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying it doesn't happen the other way, but as you know, most of the cases and the women getting killed, you can't open up the, your computer without someone someone uh, you know, finding that they've been shot or stabbed or run over or hung or strangled or something by a, an angry partner. And that's something that I hope we, you know, that we can see fixed. And as you know, there are, there are many women working, Rosie Beatty and others and myself and a raft of women and men who are trying to fix this social dysfunction in our country. But no, things are are better for women, but it's something that we just have to keep working on. And, um, you know, because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a process. We have a question from Mike in California. Do you believe mm. spousal abuse is rampant in Australia or is it just more widely uh, publicized by the media? No, it's rampant. Without question, it's rampant. It's wow. an epidemic. That's sad to hear. It is, but it's reality. Mm. Uh, is there any politician that you would trust in Australia to do the right thing for, for the people? Gosh. Um, yes, Rachel Seawert, a Greens politician. Uh, she is the one that kicked off the Senate inquiry. Uh, it took a Greens politician to, to take notice. Uh, as I said, this, the, this incident, the forced adoption, had already been through a New South Wales parliamentary inquiry and had been completely whitewashed. So, um, yeah, if I had a problem, if I had an issue, a woman's issue, female, any sort of injustice issue, I'd take it to Rachel Seawert and I'm pretty sure I could get her attention. One thing I found after reading both books is you, you get to a point in your life where you walk away with, with – you, you build yourself up to having uh, everything you want and you get to a point where you just walk away with almost nothing. That seems to be a recurring theme. Have you noticed that at all when you were writing the book that uh, there's this uh, thing of building up, building up and then suddenly um, having nothing? Well, I wouldn't say I was reduced to having nothing, but compared to where I was, as you know, Steve, I went on to be a very wealthy woman living a life that most people only dream about. But uh, in the fight for justice against people who had done the wrong thing in my business life, I was prepared to risk everything. As I said to a barrister, I'd rather live in a tent than live with the injustice. Well, I almost did get to living in a tent. But anyway, I don't regret that. I've never put money, I've never, ever put wealth and position before my principles. I've never sacrificed my principles for those uh, for, for wealth or, or position or gain. And I certainly haven't minded spending and investing what I've earned into, you know, fighting for that justice. And so the fact that I've, I've been pulled back so many times, I've always had confidence in myself to go, you know, to pull myself out of it and go forward. Now, I won't have the wealth that I once had, uh, but you know what? I came from nothing. I had absolutely nothing. I was flat-ass broke, uh, Steve, when I was 17, and I went on to become you know, a very wealthy woman. I'm not a, a very wealthy woman these days but uh, for, in terms of finances, but I consider myself a much wealthier woman uh, and human being in the things that count more to me. 
Now, one, one thing that uh, made me laugh was uh, your husband, Daryl. He's um, he, he knew a lot about life. He knew a lot about uh, business, but he was naive in the ways of the world. Would that be a true statement? I won't say that he knew a lot about life. Uh, Daryl had a very cloistered uh, life. You know, he was uh, 19. He'd been raised on a farm in England. He was a place that started out as a plumber. Uh, went, not that there's anything wrong with that. Plumbing's a very honourable trade. Uh, when I met him, he was struggling. He was bankrupt. Uh, he had a shell of a company. Uh, and together, we were a great team. Uh, unfortunately for me, I, I didn't realise that, um, you know, Daryl had a, an illness which caused him to uh, secret things away. You know, he's he's been, he, you know, and I can't really, I didn't put this in the book and I'm really not obliged to talk about his illness uh, in interviews because it's pertinent and private to him. Um, so sure. I'm not going to expose that. But there was a, you know, he had some, he had a condition which I wasn't aware of throughout our marriage. Uh, which co created a lot of problems for us um, and create sort of put a secrecy there that uh, was very difficult to to work with. Um, but no, we, we if you can imagine, Steve, we we lived and worked together twenty four hours a day, three hundred and sixty five days a week for fourteen years. Now, I don't know of any other couple that I know that's done that. So you know when you when you look back at that, something was going to give, wasn't it? And it did. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, in the first book, Ten Hail Marys, with so many awful things that happened throughout the book, it was a, a small joy to me personally to read towards the end that uh, you, you uh, had so many people asking you for forgiveness at the end of the book. It was, it was a beautiful thing. It, it touched my heart. Do you believe this book, the first book, is ultimately about closure and that we all seek to right the wrongs over the years despite all that went on in the past? Look, I, I really don't understand this word closure. I, I don't. I don't think there's closure. I think you just you just learn to accept things, you learn to understand them, uh, and if you come to understand them and you've got it in your heart to forgive, I think that's a good thing. I think forgiveness is really good for the person who is who's offering the forgiveness. Uh, but closure, no. Some things have happened in my life that I'll never have closure on them, but I've, I've learned to live with it, learned to accept it, learned to get go forward with my life. And uh, but I I just don't think you close you know you you close for instance how do you love someone and lose them and get closure it's it's always there you no know? you don't right, right. so you just it's We're, just something that you just have to keep going so in other words you're seeking a balance between it all well you you just have to accept life for what it is you know it's 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 um. It's ups and it's downs, and and just try and and deal with those things. Not wear them on your sleeve. Not not make them a you know. I think. See, I'm I'm the eternal optimist. You know, I'm I'm the half glass full person, uh, and I've mm -hmm. needed to be. I've needed to be. If pessimism had ever gotten in my way, I would have been dragged under. I'd have hit drugs, hit grog. I'd have I'd have been a mess. So I've always looked to um, on the positive side of life rather than. The negative, not to say that I don't weigh things up and calculate things out. I do, and sometimes I can be quite impulsive, as you saw when you read my book. Um, I can make some impulsive decisions, and, and they can sometimes be good, and they can sometimes be not so good. And one thing I, I remember from Lewis Klein, a, a mentor of mine that I, I mentioned, who was one of the, the fantastic people in my life who really saw my my potential, and he said to me very wisely one day, you know, Kate. Success, and this I've got to tell you, this man was one of Australia's most successful businessmen. He started Anthony Squires Menswear. You know, he was a giant in industry, and um, he said to me, "Success in business is determined. Success in life is determined by how many good decisions you make over how many bad decisions." So right, I learned. Right. To, I had to learn not to beat myself up over the bad decisions. And I think when people beat themselves up over bad decisions or even beat other people up over their bad decisions, they hold themselves back. Except that you'll make bad decisions and just get on with it. Try to make more good decisions. The one thing that you've always had uh, when you've had nothing, it seems to me you've always had this Singer sewing machine that, that's been <laughs> like a, a, a ball and chain to your leg and it's always been with you, it's part of you. Do you still have that today? If I could turn my camera on for you, right behind me now in my family room, I don't have a singer anymore, I have a Janome, 
right there on, on my on my table is the ubiquitous Nomi and the overlocker, which I had to get out this week. I'm, I'm going to Sydney this afternoon and uh, I'd promised my, my daughter-in-law that I would do some alterations for her. Uh, so I did them and I did them while I was waiting for this show to come on. So yes, it's always there. I, and I, and this, <laughs> this, <laughs> this move, this move, I've said to my son, you know, darling, I hope this is the last time I pick up this excuse the French, bloody sewing machine and walk out the door with it. But, um, yeah, I've got one more one more move to walk out the door with my sewing machine and it's it's coming very soon. So it's always there. It's I've always to, with you. I've been able to make a living out of that sewing machine, Steve. I, I ran a, a bridal wear business, remember? It used to yep, make yep, design yep. to make bridal wear <laughs> and that came about quite by accident. So that sewing machine, that's made me some money in the past, so I'm quite happy to hang on to it. And not only made you money, it's also given you credibility and reputation when people could see what you can actually do with that, the magic you could weave. Um, oh, I don't know. You, I think you're, <laughs> you're pumping me up a bit here. But anyway, we'll, we'll – uh, I – you know, sewing. Look, anything creative. I'm a creative person. Sewing's creative. It's it's a it's a, you know, it's it's an artistic thing to do, and uh, I really enjoy it. And and particularly making beautiful bright. It started off making children's wear, really, and beautiful, fancy, you know, formal wear for children. A bridesmaid's dress, the bride, a flower girl's dress is what started it all. We had a I had a bridal wear shop, and we had this massive society wedding and the the dressmaker who'd made the little girl's dress completely made a ma mess of it and the bride was just beside herself and uh, I'd made the bridal gown and and she was just hysterical it was Wednesday night the wedding was Saturday and I said look I'll I'll do it so I raced into into town and I and I was living up in Palm Beach at the time so get to town wasn't that easy it got the silk got everything I needed and I spent the next day a few couple of days head down tail up and while this was going on, at this stage, I'd had the bridal wear shop for about three years. My partner didn't know I could sew a stitch. So when I said, I'll make it, <laughs> she went, ooh. And, um, and uh, she said, well, that was, of course, with the bridal dress. She saw the, she saw the bridal gown and she, she realised that I could sew, but this ch the child's dress was even more complex than the bridal, the bridal uh, gear. And the, just the detail and the lace and the work and everything that went with it and all the silk, and she thought, my God, you know, Compared to the bridal dress, this is going to be quite a challenge, and and uh, so she was surprised I was prepared to take it on. But anyway, it was it turned out perfectly, and everybody was happy. And from then on, of course, I was uh, I was making a lot of dresses in the back in the back room of the business, and uh, she was my partner was very happy about that. Would it be fair to say that uh, running your own business, uh, doing the sewing that you did, that was probably in both books, that was probably the happiest part of your life? Would you say that would be true? Uh, no, this is the happiest part of my life right now. The life I'm living right now is the happiest part of my life. Now, back then, that was um, no. I, 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 there was always turmoil back there, Steve. As you know, there was you know that I was working and doing whatever I could do um, to uh, you know to, to keep myself occupied, keep myself busy. As you know, by the time I opened the bridal wear shop, it was really a hobby. I didn't do it for the money. I didn't need the money. Um, mm -hmm. But I did it to I did it for the activity. My daughter was at school. I you know I wanted to have our, I wanted to do something with my day, um, and uh, and also be available to be you know her primary caregiver to take her to school, bring her home, spend the holidays with her, and so on. So I went into this business with a with a friend, and um, it went from there. So, but no, I was still going through all the turmoil. As you know, I, I left the marriage. I had cervical cancer, so I had to take it very easy and concentrate on my health. Um, that was a primary. So, no, there was still a big cloud over me in those days as to whether I was even going to survive. My health was going to hold. So, no, I wouldn't say it was the happiest time of my life, not by a long shot. Right, right. We've got a final question for you, Arnie Kate, as we wrap up this interview. Uh, do you support the Stop Funding of Israel? Yes, most definitely. Uh, I would support anything that stops enabling people to oppress others. Wow. So so anywhere in the world where there's bullies, you, you want to see that stopped? Absolutely. That's Why very, not? very noble. Very don't noble. You? Don't, don't you, Steve? Uh, you stand to see I have a passion. I have, I have a personal passion for that. So, yeah, I got to agree with it. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show today, Annie Kate Howarth. It's been fantastic. Yes. It's been great fun. Thanks for your, your um, thanks for the time you had to take to read the read the book, Steve. You obviously understood it, and uh, all the little nuances in there. And I hope your your listeners have uh, enjoyed the interview. Thank you. Absolutely, I love the both the books, and I encourage anyone to go to Amazon.com and check out Kate Howarth, 
Australian author and indigenous lady who is uh, absolutely, you are an Australian icon, no, no doubt about that. And uh, I want to thank you once again for your time and, and hope to see you one day as a host on the People Who Speak show, if possible. Well, I will be a host on the show at the end of November. As you know, I'm coming back to interview Rabbi Rosen. Awesome. Awesome. I can't wait for that. Excellent. Oh, thank excellent. you very much, Annie Kate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye for now. You're listening to the People Speak show with special guest author Kate Howarth. I'd like to remind all the listeners to look out for her books on Amazon titled Settling Day and Ten Hail Marys. Uh, join us coming up on the People Speak show soon when I talk to David Ray Griffin and other important hosts and guests from all around the world. Stay tuned for those interviews coming soon. Big thanks go out to the producers Mike, Donald, and Doug, and to all my friends throughout the world, to all the guys who give me so much support. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Hope you enjoyed the show just as much as I did. You can tune into my own channel on YouTube called Stop Funding Israel. But for me for now, take care and bye until next time. One bright sunny morning.